This is Digital Marketing Fastlane. This podcast will show you how to build, launch, grow, and scale a widely successful online business. Listen to real conversations with proven practical strategies and success stories. You're going to learn how to generate more traffic, more sales, more profit, and customer lifetime value for your online store. Coming to you from the online marketing experts at Voy Media, here's your host, Kevin Urrutia. Hey everybody, it's Kevin Rubita here from Digital Marketing Fastlane. I'm here joined with Eric Philippou. Hey Eric, what's up? Hey, how are you? Good. We're excited to hit this podcast because this is a brand we've been looking at for a pretty long time. Kevin, you've spoken to them directly a little or, you know, some... Uh, about maybe a year and a half, two ago. So, oh, wow. Yeah. yeah, well, they're doing a lot of good stuff and there's a lot of like uh, really easy opportunities for improvement probably. There's going to be a lot of actionable takeaways for, that you can use for your brand if you're watching this or listening. If you're listening, definitely check it out on YouTube so you can see the different uh, landing pages and ads and things we talk about. This really cool presentation. I remember telling Eric that I, I spoke to them a while ago. Their ads and campaigns have just like, changed so much mm-hmm. from a year ago. I wish there was like a history for like ads that you could see. I remember when they first started ads, it was kind of like, those traditional like brandy type of ads that you see, Eric, that's not direct response, switching to kind of what we're going to go over right now. So it's interesting to see how people and brands are realizing that like you actually need to sell online and not just like show your brand off. And not only just direct response ads, you know, you're going to see some of the things in the ads that some of the best examples of, you know, so a lot of suggestions we've made on other podcasts. So they do a lot of things really well on the ads and especially in the landing pages and the testing, you can tell, You'll, you, there's a lot of takeaways you're going to like from this. So the agenda, we're going to talk about their creative creative variety. We're going to talk about their landing pages, not just the design, but how they choose different landing pages for different ads. And then their website, website CRO, just some good things they're doing on the website. And also, there's also some low-hanging fruit improvements that we're going to talk about where they can really knock it out of the park. So creatives, I'm going to open their ads library in a second. When we're looking at the ads library, you can open it up on your tab too if you're watching this on YouTube. Look at their variety. Look at their how they deposition themselves. Look at how they use authority. Uh, and then look at objection blocking. When I say objection blocking, you know, I always say the two main reasons people don't want to click something or buy something are trust or, or price. Those are the most common ones, at least. They do a really good job addressing price and trust in almost every ad. So you're going to see that. Ad library as well, too. Uh, let me actually expand this a little. What do you have impressions by? Impressions by recency? Okay, yeah. So I mean, now this is better. Look, you can do impressions by last 30 days, right? So basically last 30 days, which are the best ads, right? We did notice maybe let's sort it by all impressions yep. just to be safe because they do have an ad. I want to show you something more than 90 days ago that's worth noting. Some of these ads, you know, they're for pans or for knives. Really user focused. It's what someone does with a knife. They're cutting some meat or they're making something in a pan. So obviously it's pretty cool. We're gonna go ahead and click one of these videos. So one thing right here, if you're, actually we have our headphones and stuff on, so you probably didn't hear any of that. It possibly just had a, like, 14 seconds of complete silence, but we were playing an ad. Basically, it shows someone cooking risotto, and you wouldn't be able to know, especially in ads manager, especially in Facebook, if you're just scrolling or Instagram, but there's audio over the video. They don't have subtitles or a banner to say what the video is about. So if I'm just scrolling in my feed and I see this, all I see is the same visuals you're seeing. I'm even going to turn this off, but you just see risotto being made. Especially, it doesn't really show the pan very much. I think it's starting off really smart. The audio is really smart. The audio, you see, you hear the sizzle, then someone talking about why they love the pan. If they just put that, maybe they did a hook of a really cool sizzle and flipping something, like flipping the fried rice, like a wok almost. And then, like, as a hook. And then you talk to someone in their kitchen, shows them talking about it with subtitles. That would be more effective. This is obviously a new ad they just launched a few days ago. I do like the copy, though. So, like I said, they go very hard on authority. 
And that's very good. So this nonstick pan raised over a million dollars on Kickstarter and will outlast pans that cost up to $100. So that's a really good way to both get authority and then deposition yourselves from maybe the competitors who are more expensive. So that's really good. They're getting both trust and price in it. And even the headline is save 20% you know, on your first one. So that's really cool. And even on the left, this I'd copy. I love this even more. This is really cool. So this is the holy grail um, of knives. You know, basically, Serious Eats, if you're their target customer, which I, I guess I imagine I am because I follow Serious Eats, I get their ads all the time. We have ad copy that says Serious Eats called this knife the holy grail of knives. You know, that's obviously a very excited. Like, I take this knife much more seriously than some drop shipper, yeah. even if, if you know, it's the same exact product. I would take it this much more seriously um, than if I saw some drop shipper or something. So that's really good. This authority, they really have to establish just to get taken seriously in such a competitive niche. With this brand, they're really leveraging trust authority with this number. Like 1 million sounds like a lot. And people are like, oh my mm -hmm. God, that's crazy. Like these guys must be good. So it's like inherently other people are supporting it. Serious Eats, if you're in this niche or space, you know what that is. Those are things that you should be leveraging in. A lot of people are like on these big publications that they just don't use it because they don't realize it. But like for a cold prospect that hasn't heard about your brand, these are just really, really good things to do. These kind of secondary media outlets, I don't know. I don't want to bash them. I don't mean to degrade them in any way. But these, it's not like New York Times. It's Serious Eats. They're much more approachable. So like if you're doing, I guess, PR, it's much more likely to get a spot in these secondary things. But they're taken even more seriously than like New York Times in many cases depending on the niche or what they say, you can do PR for these other ones pretty well. And, you know, obviously your target customers there, it's an awesome way to do that. You'll get someone who will write a very, I guess, biased piece in your favor. They're much more excited about your product than we have brands. They're in Vogue. They're in these huge mm -hmm. publications and we try to pull quotes of it, but the writers, they just write, they basically copy and paste it from our product. Page. Kevin, do you have any other insight on that? Sometimes being on these like big PR pieces aren't super helpful because it goes like when you said it's like they don't really care about the product. They're just writing it because they're writing it. But when you're on like, let's say for hiking, you're on Backpacker. Mm -hmm. That is another really big thing. Backpacker actually like test the product or like something like wire cutter where they actually test the products. And then when you're on these other like third party or sometimes bigger sites, they're just like Business Insider reviews, right? So like if you get on there, of course it's great. They're just like generic copy and description. Mm -hmm. They're just doing it for the affiliate commission, right? So if you yeah. go like Best Mattress, it's like, it's great that you're on there because that ranks for SEO, but I don't know. It's not like proof of credibility. Kind of like what you are saying before, like Serious Eats actually like test the stuff and their niche audience is truly defined. But of course, all these companies need to make money somehow, so. Consumer is completely unaware of 99% of that. The benefit of it yeah we talk about these oh well it's not a big deal it's not a big deal to you it might not be but to the consumer it's a huge deal yep. um especially if they see oh they're in a listicle by business insider it must be more serious than maybe some drop shipper or the one i can find at target or walmart i kind of talked negatively about this ad but they make up for it right away with these other ads that do it so much better like this egg spin that you'll see they're doing cool stuff. They're showing cooking videos. You have the knife, then they have the pans. It's basically really cool cooking videos that you can make with the pans. You can mm -hmm. honestly do this with any pan or knife, but it just gets you excited about it, especially when you see the eggs slide off like that. It shows the non-stick angle. And this is something we're going to talk about in landing pages, but if you click this, it goes to the non-stick landing page. So mm -hmm. they have landing pages dedicated just to each angle, which is smart. So I guess another angle is going to go to a different one. What they're cooking is interesting. It's not mm -hmm. just like an egg, like this tornado thing, whatever they're doing right now, it's kind of interesting. I'm like, oh, what is this? It gets you curious about what they're cooking, but then also like inherently they're advertising their product. So all the food stuff they're cooking here is like super high quality food. It's not mm -hmm. like this random, like this steak looks like really good, probably a lot of money. Versus like a Walmart $5 steak that's like thin and, you know, full of fat. Food that they're actually using on here is high quality food. That's also showing that the brand is for high quality. If you had like a cheap sort of, you know, bad looking food, you'd be like, oh, like this is not interesting and probably won't catch their mm -hmm. eye. Smart marketing move. You know, this isn't for someone who cooks 
pancakes once every six months when their girlfriend is at home. You know what I mean? It's, this me. is for someone who cooks every day. You cook every day. I go through a lot more pans. I'm like their target customer in a sense. I'm more likely to buy this. At- Never buy this because like, it's just not interesting to me, right? Mm-hmm. But for you, you have books, you have recipes that you do. But for me, I'm just like, oh, like, let me go on Seamless and see what, what's trending. They know their target customer yeah. pretty well. And, and that's something interesting too. Like, like you as the marketer might not be the target customer. This is a good example of a brand that really understands the target customer. So this is really good. And something also just cool here visually, this is a very smart, the tornado omelet they do, the way they spin the pan to show that nonstick feature, like in it, you can spin it still with the thing not falling apart. Looks really, really cool. And it's something you can only do with a really good nonstick pan. So that means they're really playing chess, not checkers. This pan looks dirty though. Completely different vibe than this one on the yeah. right. Yeah, at a first glance, I thought this is like, they're kind of depositioning themselves. Like, yeah. okay, this is the stick one. It's going to ruin the steak. And then show the non-stick one or something like that. Thought too, and I think that would be a cool video to make. Yeah. That would be, reminds me of like Dr. Squatch videos where they're like yeah. depositioning all the other uh, soaps and deodorants. But this, so yeah, I think that'd be a great video if you have like a, two pans, the same steak, and then you see how like, one sticks, that'd be a great one. Mm-hmm. That would be really, really yeah. cool. People who cook a lot, they know like when they're using bad equipment, it could have a really bad impact on the food. So especially something like nice, like a steak. So that's pretty cool. But what this video actually is, it's just a steak sizzle. Just a seven second video. Is there sound on it actually? Sound of the sizzle, which is also pretty cool. Really simple hook, really simple video. Literally anyone can make this at home. So another thing they do, they're doing a lot of different animations. So this one, I think is a one second, I guess, boomerang style video. It just plays on a loop. It's just pretty cool. It just shows, I guess, the versatility of the pan, different things you make, even though I think this is all the same recipe. I can't. Yeah, they have reasons why non-stick pan is actually worth your money. So now they're going for price. I mean, look at that. Look at these visuals. This is really cool. Yeah, Load that's a cool one. And glide. That's, that's cool, actually. Oh, this is cool. I see the swirl a lot on all these pan ads, but this, yeah, this is really cool. I've never seen that before. <laughs> That's cool. That's so funny. Stress test. They're cooking like literal metal. That's crazy. Only $50 similar pan costs $130. Like this is a great ad. You know, this is a, you know, just yeah. depositions themselves. They, they attack price, durability. Like each reason is a different benefit. It's not like they expand on the same benefit. So that's pretty yeah, it's cool. A good, it's a good ad. Then this here is just like cool stuff, like a cool watermelon. I actually made watermelon feta salad last weekend. Uh, Did you? On Instagram. Yeah. Uh, so this is just funny that they launched this. Yeah, more of this cool cutting stuff like that. Um, it looks like they all launched these tests around the same time. So this is like a user-generated content style review. Just like we saw with Lumen and Dr. Squatch and other episodes on the podcast, people reviewing it. It is pretty good. You know, good classic style. This is what I envisioned. Like, if you see something like this as a hook, you start with that. And then it goes into someone speaking, maybe try that. Or the guy blowing on the egg can be a great hook and goes into some user-generated content review. A lot of these very, very cool visuals yeah. are great as hooks. You can then try You can then try on a lot of other style videos, not just the original ad creative you made it for. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Okay. Nice. The secret to the secret ingredient to better cooking. This is interesting. So they have, they have so many creatives we can go through all day basically and talk about. Nice. This is a really cool video. They just show all the different benefits of you know all the different things you can make. Nice. It looks like they are targeting Asian food. Yep. Which is interesting. Nice. Like targeting the Asian market. Nice. There's so many food niches, so they can target different consumers based on what they're cooking. Oh yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. That could be like a certain landing page, right? That could be like, oh, look, cook your favorite Asian food, right? Where nonstick, you mm-hmm. know, make your pad thai, whatever that is, whatever, right? Make your favorite Indian food, chicken tikka masala, my favorite Indian dish. And then mm-hmm. that, that might attract me. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many food niches and target audiences you can do. They do a lot, basically. We'll move on to other stuff, but they deposition themselves well. They, looks like, another thing I want to show, you know, they have all different stuff. Best I've ever owned, hands down, cutting stuff. 
towards the bottom are even more interesting insights. Um, obviously, they're launching this. They were, by the way, they've been running this style and this style. You saw they made iteration like this. This they had running in April, right? The foolproof eggs video yep. and these little loops. Oh, this one too. So yeah, it must be doing really well. So that's another thing you want to look for whenever you're looking at an ads library. If they're making, if you see a lot of things recently, then you go further back. Similar things were running a few months ago, and they're still active now. That means it was successful. They're scaling it, and they're probably iterating on it in the more recent ads. That's a very big takeaway. Yeah, they're obviously really good food, really sexy food. Um, they know what they're doing. Uh, let's click with, I'm not sure what this is. Oh, just more reason videos. So right now it's August, I think, 7th yeah. and 2020. And they have ads running from November 2019. Specifically, this one is a holiday ad. If you just click, it just says 25% off of Snowflakes. They're still running it. I don't know what budget, but I imagine they're not going to run it if it's not good. And hey, we've seen examples of this. We've had brands, huge brands, by the way, you know, top 100 Shopify sites. And they had a Black Friday ad running till April or May. Whenever we talk to brands about a you know, Mother's Day promotion or anything, just keep running it till it's not good. I wouldn't be surprised if the 25% off doesn't even exist. Let's click it. Probably has a lot of social proof. Take a look at it, Eric. It says the URL says chef hyphen one, but when you click on it, it goes to chef hyphen two. Updated this page internally to be a different page, but the ad probably has so much social proof that they wanted to redirect it to the new landing page is probably converting better. They probably did some testing or something. You know, this landing page is good. Chef, you know, one or yeah. chef two, chef three. It looks like they've been running this for a long time. You know, she's just like trying it and cutting it. There's like some kind of unboxing video. You can't see her unboxing it. Yeah, she's basically just talking about how good it is. I personally would like subtitles just because most people watch these videos with sound off. And we've been doing this with a lot of brands, credible looking people. There's one specifically a jewelry brand we work with that does this very well. And, you know, they've scaled to the moon, especially on Snapchat, where it's more native. It's an iPhone video version of this. Definitely in your repertoire of creative, definitely include one of these. You can tell they've been running it for a long time. And it's still working well, even though this returns are now free through February 20. It's still not relevant. Also redirect to that. Chef's yeah. to landing page. So there are a lot of good things they're doing with landing pages. And there are some things we think that they can improve. Let's actually talk about the negative things first. When you click their landing page, first of all, okay, you got the hero image. You got the really cool headline. But there aren't many call to action buttons. So if this landing page, its goal is to sell me on the product, right? You got the header. Okay, but I actually advise to not put the header. We advise a lot of times to not have a header, just to direct people to a specific action you want them to take. Maybe you want to sell a specific product or a specific offer. But this is great. You know, they're talking a lot more. They're trying to sell you um, some credibility. It looks like their story, the most important food tool in the kitchen. They're trying to sell you. They even have this cool video. Play it. It looks like a YouTube. They say a YouTube URL. They're putting a lot into it. I haven't seen this in such a long time. This lingo, by partnering closely with our factories and selling directly to you online, that's the oldest thing that people have done for years. I mean, everything's D to C. This was the language that people used three, four years ago. Obviously, you know, Eric, like Casper, every company was saying this. Everything's D to C now. Like, uh, basically, like the, the gameplay for this was like, hey, look, we save you money by partnering directly with factories and there's no middleman. Your new middle, you just switch your middleman. It's not stores anymore. It's Facebook or Google. Yeah, or if there's no middleman, it means it's drop shipping. Another funny one is like, oh, this is the night that sold out three times, or the product sold out three times. That could just mean they had inventory problems. They didn't know how to manage their inventory. It could mean they ordered 10, and then like, okay, cool, we sold out. Sold out, but we could talk about it as a marketing angle. People yeah. think it's a scarcity appeal, or only one left in stock. We know it's a joke, and we mm -hmm. know like what they're doing, but as regular people, they still don't know. But I yeah. think people are going to get smarter, right? And eventually, we've been saying this for years, and people still fall for this stuff, so... But I mean, even like my wife just bought something recently because, oh, it keeps getting sold out. We have to get it. It must mean it's really good. Yeah. They're putting a lot of effort in this landing page, you could tell, but it's lacking something. Honestly, one of the most important things is call to action buttons. This landing page that they're working so hard to sell me, if it's selling me, I can't move forward in the process really. I think there's one here all the way, literally right before the footer. We always advise, you know, call to actions on every like block. And then a sticky call to action button on the top. So whenever you scroll, it's always on the top. 
So that's a main thing where their click-through rates on the landing page to the product page is probably going to go way up just by implementing something like that. And I want to show you their homepage for a second. And you saw in their ads is authority. So their authority, like if you're on their homepage, so, okay, Kickstarter, Serious Eats, 14,000 reviews, like Epicurious, all the Food 52, very, this is a big deal that other brands that are competing with them would kill to have. And they need to put that front and center on their landing page where they're getting a lot of this traffic because this traffic is going to be much more interested. They have a lot of this block text you have to read for that, but simply literally paste, like dragging this to here, like right here or right here would do a lot more psychologically to the consumer than all this block text. So that's something really important. Establishing that authority is such a great way to differentiate yourself from competition, especially in this cutthroat, no pun intended, cutthroat competitive niche of nine. You want the landing page to match the angle of the ad. So for example, like the nonstick sort of ads that we saw really go to that sort of nonstick unreal price talks about all these benefits about nonstick pants. It just really makes sense because if someone is interested in the sort of nonstick feature that you're talking about, might as well show them more about it or even explain it a little bit more in depth. A whole page about it. The other brands, like, you know, are, they just drive you to like a product page. All the features that product has, where this is like they're making it front and center. One thing that they probably will redirect, I think, if you scroll all the way down, right? So this is a great landing page for nonstick. When you have that call to action, I've seen more success when you make it go directly to the checkout now versus... Right now, it goes to the product page again. And it's kind of confusing because there's a discount, but then it goes to like this page and then the discount is sort of lost somewhere where it's like that, not that price you just saw. And then now you're making another decision of, okay, what size should I get? Now really like into buying this product and it's helping them. I would say if it's possible, can you put this like on the bottom, right? Of that landing page, choose your size and add to cart and automatically shoot, shoot you over to the cart. And we've done that in the past with a lot of success. You know, if you're watching this now, it's August, you're definitely thinking about Q4 if you're a brand. You know, in Q4, these landing pages are really, really effective. Yep. And anything you can do to have less clicks is going to be very important because a shopper knows, okay, this website sucks, goodbye. They know that like in Q4, there's almost like an entitlement the shoppers have. Like you need us more than we need you. They'll leave if there's the slightest website friction. They know every website has a deal. Whatever you can do to reduce that friction is great. Why the call to action is at the bottom is because like you want to be truly sold on the product before you even click mm. to here. Mm -hmm. People do read them. Once you're sold, it's like, okay, let me now continue this process because I already know I want it. But even then, I would try to maybe make that sort of experience a little different. Maybe... If you're talking about, let's say, non-stick, for example, maybe make non-stick sort of product page that continues to talk about that benefits because right now this product page is generic. You can still keep that sort of funnel and process going, but of course, that's a lot more work. But companies that do this really well are companies in the supplement space where they're doing the whole funnel is completely uh, personalized to that sort of angle. I call this like e-commerce 1.0, the basics of it, where people are kind of doing marketing, whereas like there's other niches, let's say hymns or supplements, they're really, or internet marketing niches, like, you know, biz ops, those guys are truly doing marketing. This is kind of like taking snippets of that and making it good. It could be so much more optimized and, and people don't think about it. I don't want to make a separate landing page. I don't want to make a separate SKU, but that's what you should be doing because that's going to improve your yeah. rates. Click on that guy. I want to see something. This is for the knife. So they actually are doing this. You just put your best color, right? Or like your most mm -hmm. obvious one. And then if people want it, they can sort of do options. But yeah, I would do some, something different like that. And then linking to the product page, that's something linking to the cart page versus the product page. That's something you can do in most landing page tools, right? Yeah. The reason why you could do it too is because Shopify makes it super easy. It's just like a mm -hmm. URL. If you just Google like Shopify direct to cart checkout URL, yeah. you'll realize that like you see on the URL, there's like this variant equals. You just need to mm -hmm. put that in the correct position and automatically we'll do it. We, there's a brand we work with specifically that does this, a lot of retargeting ads. Yeah. And, or sometimes they'll go top of funnel straight to a cart page. Yeah, uh, you can do this for retargeting ads. Yeah. It's a URL that you can put directly into Facebook. Honestly, we've seen like bumps of 20, 30% orders from just 
being direct. It reduces a step in the purchasing journey. So the conversion rate generally increases, especially if you're retargeting someone who spent a lot of time on the product page or has visited the product page and is very conscious of what it is. And you bring them to, you know, maybe a cart page with the specific product in the mm -hmm. cart already, as if they've already decided. So that's yeah. a very smart move. I think it works better than sometimes doing it just a slash cart page. It's just mm -hmm. items in there. If you bring them to a cart page with an embedded discount code already added, as if they yep. would not get that discount otherwise, so they're okay, oh, we definitely got to purchase now. Yep. You know, you put a scarcity appeal on the ad itself, maybe a, a overcome whatever objection like price or trust that they left the product page for. You can have a very effective ad that way, much better conversion rates, very cool way to do landing page optimization. I'm confused by the price because it said 55, now it's 65. So there's like a real confusion about what, what just happened. The, the pan or one of those, right? You see here, it's offer price save. This is where I think you would need like a custom funnel with this offer price fall through because mm -hmm. now you're just sort of like disconnect between the price and sort of what you're seeing now. What you could do here too, Eric, is just like duplicate this SKU and then on this SKU only have that discount. That way it has mm -hmm. a slash price. And then regular yeah. customers that come to the shop see the full price. And this is a hidden product in your Shopify store. That way no one can see it unless they see from an ad. And then that's when you can really tell, like, it helps you also with like, you know, just attribution too. Having offers that you only run to pay traffic because maybe that offer you can absorb the cost of goods sold or the margins mm -hmm. or something. Whereas maybe something else you might not. So, you know, selectively choosing the offers like that. Uh, are really good, especially maybe with top of funnel, you have a good repeat purchase rate. You, there's a lot you can do with that. So that's a very smart point that Kevin brings up. I think what happens is people fall into this trap of, oh my God, people are going to browse my site and then see that this isn't on sale. I'm like, no one's going to do that at all. Like people think about their websites as like this thing that like people want to spend time browsing. It's but... the same logic as like if I sell the same exact product like Nizen on yeah. Amazon for $85. And we have brands that do the same thing. They'll sell something for you know, whatever, 25% more on Amazon. They get sales a lot on it. And people think, oh, but they're going to check my website. And on Amazon, they're going to see it's different. By that logic, they're going to check AliExpress and Alibaba, see something much different. So yeah. people aren't browsing the internet for the best deal. It's like in that book, Propaganda, Bernays. People are open to you suggesting a purchase option to them because yeah. they don't want to look up, analyze every single available option on the market. There would be no point of advertising otherwise. People want you to present them an offer, whether they realize it or not. They're mm -hmm. not going to analyze every single item on the market. My wife does, but she's the only person who does. Of course, there's people like that that do that, but then it's not everybody. Benefit focused, the different play of how they use different angles or different offers and how they design the landing pages. There's so much strategy behind that. But let's also take a look at what the actual landing page is. First of all, we recommend no header just so they can't click somewhere else, especially here. It's just about or account cart. This is top of funnel traffic, which they most likely is. Half of these aren't going to be relevant. It's just going to hurt your conversion rate. So that being said, I would also remove that. But, you know, the perfect knife, unreal price, really cool. Add more authority. Why are good knives so expensive? They're depositioning themselves from the overexpensive knife. I think a little too much block text, in my opinion. They're just driving home a lot of benefits. Nice. If you have some social proof, just you got to go really far to find it. So you have the actual layout of the structure. You know, when we suggest a landing page, we suggest no header, no header navigation. I mean, then a big headline text, headline text, a hero image. Then you go into benefits, social proof and some, a lot of call to actions, basically, as much as possible. So that's something very important. Do it mobile optimized. Have your call to actions on mobile. Take the whole width of the screen so people's thumbs can hit it easily when they're browsing their phone. Things like that, that's what we suggest, which there's a lot that they can do here, but there's a lot that they do well. They tell a really good story. They tell about their brand a lot. So overall, you can tell they're trying really hard to make a good landing page. It looks like they're doing like just default Shopify landing pages. I think their landing pages also look better on mobile. They might have more mobile traffic because Facebook just gives you more mobile traffic. The header doesn't look as bad. Oh, it does look better on mobile, but all the text gets really jumbled up. I would definitely take a look at that. And the call to action stuff, like if they were to test a new landing page with more call to actions, I would be interested to see the results. You can learn just from their landing page, what they're doing well, what they can improve. 
So now let's talk about their website, good authority, bundling, e-commerce stuff. Their website, I imagine they get a lot of search traffic because you know they're. I think they're a pretty well-known brand. I'm not sure actually. I think they've been around for a while now. Nice. Yeah, I imagine with all these uh, reviews and stuff, you know, Kickstarter, especially they started on, you know, and we've worked with some brands who started on Kickstarter. You know, that's a really good indicator of success that I imagine they're doing well. Like there's a lot of credibility. Look, they have so many reviews. They really put their reviews right near the price. Thinks, oh, is that too much money? But then they see 6,000 five-star reviews. Well, it looks like it's worth it, you know? And then links to the actual reviews. So that's awesome. I guess the product page though. Yes, yeah, that's something to do well. And then, like I said, the authority, they do so well too. Mm-hmm. Like um, the Kickstarter thing is huge. The Serious Eats thing is huge. Five-star reviews. What I do like t- here too, is it's a mix of different things. It's not just the logos, PR, like number of reviews. They do some huge accolade and then they do an actual quote, not just the logos, which I think is pretty cool. They pick stuff that makes sense where I think most people, when they're doing quotes and reviews, they're kind of just picking something random. Something I've seen, I think, where people do, they'll usually pick like the top quote uh, mm-hmm. like to be like the first one on the page. And then the second one will be like another good one. And then like, as they're going down less good quotes, mm-hmm. but in reality, what it should be was like the first one should be your best one in the middle should be your mediocre one. And then, and then the last two should be your, another two really good ones. It's kind of like when you're giving bad advice, you want to give it in the middle, but as you're scrolling mm-hmm. down, you want to keep showing good ones and not mediocre ones. Because then like at that point, that's when you have your call to action button. So above your call mm-hmm. to action button, that's when you have to want to have another good review. And that's assuming they don't do the classic boy media suggestion, which is the sticky call to action button. Yep. That's why so many people you want the price next to the reviews to kind of mitigate any things they would have towards the price. You want to put something positive also near the add to cart button to make them more excited to click add to cart. Whether it's a positive quote, you could even just put the logos of, you know, like Visa or something like that, just to show a little more credibility or something. I was listening to some world authority on CRO and they do that standard operating procedures. They put the logos of the different, uh, very credible payment processors. And a lot of the brands we work with that do that, we do see very good add to cart rates, sometimes 15, 20% add to cart rates on the website, whereas some brands we see don't do that. Um, they're add to cart rates in the single digit percentages. Having the trust badges like, McAfee, Norton, mm. right? Pure SSL. That stuff definitely boosts conversion rates at least 20% from what we see. Oh, yeah. Of course, you can have too much, but if you have like three or four, that works really great. Uh, instead of 5% add to cart rate to a 10% add to cart rate, which is extremely feasible with a couple minor realistic adjustments, you're doubling the number of people adding to cart. And yeah. if you have like a very steady add to cart to purchase ratio, you're, you're almost doubling your business. Um, they are doing their quotes. Looks like on a, you know, some really cool things on the product page. Their product page, I'm not mad about their product page at all. Like I said, on their website, other than their landing page, they do authority. They a really good job doing authority. You know, their product really page really is cool pretty stuff. nice. They're really detailed. Good mm-hmm. visuals too. A lot of good reviews. Nice. People using them. Yeah, I love this when you can tell a very legit product when they show all the, re- all the reviews at the bottom. Especially, you know, ironically, as advertised, is just a great quote. Um, you know, verified buyers. You know, even with some of these tools, you know, it's just a verified email address. It's not a verified buyer, so it can be astroturfed a lot. But this looks pretty legit, and the number of them is astounding. You know, questions are also interesting. It goes a really long way, as opposed to if you just click some drop shipper knife, or if you were at Target and looking for another knife, you know, this uh, really differentiates, or nonstick pan for that matter, this goes a really long way. So they're doing a great job on their homepage and their product page. Kind of what we say before, where your product page and this website, you own it. So why not fill it mm-hmm. out with content that you know is going to be good, that's going to be helpful for consumers? Scared to put content, but why? Like people are looking for this information. There's a reason mm-hmm. why people go to review sites because they want to learn more. You should be, uh, you know, filling in as much content as you possibly can on your own site. I'll give you an example. These high ticket items, maybe this is like a $45 item, but even this niche, it it can get up there. It can get expensive. 
wherever you have higher ticket items, you get a lot of what's called delayed attribution. People want to review other things. They want to look up reviews. They want to do some research. Like the reasons why people are not purchasing right away, they're hesitant. If you can address them on your site, that's huge. So they do that really well with the overwhelming number of positive reviews. And then you can scroll and actually see them, which is awesome. Even they have the question, the verified buyers, that goes a long way. And imagine you go to a store in a shopping mall and you're thinking of buying some sweatshirt and there's 3,428 people who just bought that sweatshirt standing like on the side of you of the checkout counter saying, yeah, this is awesome. Get it, get it, get it. It's like, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the equivalent of it. And like, so just having this, which is not that hard to do, obviously getting the reviews is hard. That's an amazing feat by the business, but adding that feature to the website is a pretty simple thing to add. And it makes almost that kind of impact. It has a huge impact. Like you said, people are afraid to add content to their website, but they're not equating it. This is a shopping experience. Yep. And there's a reason why it works. It's like inherently when people are reading stuff like this online, they feel lonely. Those things work well. Like, oh, there's three people reading this site or, or someone from like New York is checking out this site as well. Like people, even though like people like to feel like they're not the only ones doing something. So that's why reviews are mm -hmm. so important because it sort of, it plays on that sort of part of, oh, someone else purchased it too. So I'm making a good decision or like someone. So basically they, it's like it removes the blame from themselves. There's just so much more trust. Like if so many other people are saying it's good, it must be good. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like peer pressure, the psychology of peer pressure. Yeah. I guess in a way that works for you, it's not like we're making them do something bad. We're giving them a better pan. You know, we're giving them a better product from a shopper standpoint. If I click add to cart, I would get whatever I just saw where to go. I'll just click this and you see this. So this is pretty cool. Just right to the checkout. I actually like this a lot. Um, it's just straight to business. Like, okay, you, you have this and a uh, big checkout button. It looks like there's some, you know, trust badge here or even multiple payment installment option, which I'm seeing more and more of these days. Uh, gift message. That's cool. This is very simple stuff. One that does this, I should like, this is a better version of it, but Lumen has a similar layout. I think what's missing here is like just the badges. That's like, we just seen like a 20% boost in AO in, in just like checkouts just by having the badges there. Yeah, the badges go a long way. The user cannot find this, but if you go to the slash cart page where we run a lot of add to cart, cart abandonment ads too, it looks like they did have some trust badge, like PayPal. Those aren't really trust badges, but they're logos that people are familiar with. Um, if they put like American Express Visa, like credit cards accepted, you know, that's another thing. You know, there's a lot you can do for that. Uh, it's just a matter of taking their logos. So the checkout looks like a standard Shopify checkout. Not that many people do enough testing on this checkout. It's like probably like one of the most important pages and people just use the stock default one. Like if you're on Shopify plus, you can do a lot of customizations. So it's just add the badges. You've probably seen other, like, honestly, if you think about it, like drop shippers have better checkout pages than this one, right? You've seen those where they have like, Hey, three people checking out right now. You have like the mm -hmm. reviews on the side, you have the security badges, right? You can of course make it nice and clean, but like, this is so plain, like it works, but I'm no for a fact, if you just make it better and you can actually like on the bottom, you add reviews, you can increase yeah. that sort of checkout rate. I would argue this is one of the most neglected parts of the it, funnel. It is. What happens uh, after your card. Yeah. This is probably the most neglected part when it's probably like almost as important as that like sort of front end sort of landing page. And, and a big indicator that you need this is if you have a lot of added cards, not a lot of purchases. So yeah. you're working so hard to get the people on the site to click. You're working so hard on the product page to persuade them to add it to cart. Now you just have to get them to check out a lot of times you'll see like only a 20% checkout rate and that's on top of a 2% add to cart rate. So like a very small fraction of people are actually going to convert. But if you can make it like, okay, 50% of the people who add to cart actually check out 80%, you know, whatever you can do, you're going to get so much more business. Like I, I sound like a broken record on these podcasts saying it, but if you increase your conversion rate from 1% to 2%, you're doubling your business. Get people mm -hmm. that add to cart a little easier, get people to check out a little easier. I would love a phone number right? Call to order. My maid company right here, we're in maid sailors. Like most of our mm -hmm. bookings come from phone calls. More than half our bookings come from people calling to book the order because they have more questions. 
And another great thing about booking over the phone is that you need to train your sales reps to upsell. I'd say, hey, look, want this? Get another one. We see much higher AOV from phone calls because now it's like you're trusting the person on the phone. Oh, this is a real company now. You see like that realness, right? When someone wants to book a high ticket service, anything above 3, 4K, why do you get on a phone call? Because you want to make sure that you're actually paying a a price to someone that you can talk to. So that's the same thing as when you're selling a product like this, that's like $65 plus. Because actually when back before quarantine, when I used to work in the office, I literally sat behind a guy who answered the phone calls that yep. you're talking about for, I think it was for Montem. Yep. And I hear, oh, he's going for the upsell. He's like really good at customer service. Yeah. Like, oh, actually, oh, you ordered this rain jacket. I actually wore this one during work today. You're not going to get tons of phone calls, right? It's not like you have to hire a whole other team. Yeah. And I'm sure you as an e-commerce owner, the person listening, um, you're familiar with customer service. A lot of our clients who are one man people, one man teams, at some point you have to outsource it to a team if you're some huge company, but uh, obviously don't put your personal cell phone number if you could be mindful of upsell them but i'll hear them saying oh where are you going this weekend for oh you're going hiking yeah. this weekend yeah. uh, where are you going it gets pretty cold up in that mountain uh what's like your gear for that situation build rapport and then maybe say oh you know it gets pretty cold you know we do have a jacket for 25 percent off if you want you can make it very human you know to be salesy um you can yeah. be very human and personal about it and people love that you truly understand what problems customers are having right so you mm-hmm. can then give the recordings uh, we record all our calls for made sailors for our cleaning company. So we will see like what issues we can have. You can then send them to your Facebook team, right? Saying, hey guys, like these are questions we get. Maybe we should address them either on the landing page or on the product page, right? You could come with you said before, you can you can upsell them easier. Right? It's more of an easier thing. Like, oh, by the way, we have this thing just in case you want it. If it becomes really big and it's like becomes a great thing, you can then outsource it. I tell founders like, oh, put like put online chat put a phone call and then they're like, mm-hmm. no, I don't want to talk to customers. I'm like, what's well, your company? Why don't you want to talk to customers? I'm like, I don't understand yeah. how you think like you can just like completely run a business without talking to customers. And for all my companies, I've done all that stuff. And I just don't get that sort of mentality of what if I get a call at 10 o'clock at night? I'm like, yeah, like I would love for a customer to call me at 10 o'clock at night. That means business is working. <laughs> Even on a podcast, there's that D2C e-commerce legend, Dennis Hegstad, his whole app, Live Recover, shout out to Dennis. You're at this part and you, you're, you add to cart and you have some sort of question or objection, you can text it. And it's like a live customer service team that just addresses all of the objections via text. They can even upsell, I think. And people keep trying to copy Dennis on that, not successfully, of course, because they're messing with a gangster. My point is that such a that's a niche in itself, a business niche itself is card abandonment SMS in e-commerce. Like there, there's so much room because there's so much demand for it. Because there's so much card abandonment and people looking to have their objections addressed. They're looking for a human to touch, especially mm-hmm. now in like this sort of space where people just want to talk to somebody. If you're looking at a brand like Mison or any website, or you're looking to improve your card abandonment rate, your conversion rate, those are some really good tactics you can do. What else we got? Bundling. So this is another thing Mison does really well. Just if you go to their homepage real quick, I have so many other tabs open. I'm just going to go ahead. Well, yeah, affordable luxury, you know, they have good messaging, but they did, I did see something as you're scrolling, save more when you bundle. You have everything you need one place for two eighty-five. dollars I'd be really interested what their average order value is on their Shopify site. I have a feeling it's like higher than one product. If you remember, Eric, in their ads, do they advertise their bundles? I think I did see a couple of them really far down the line. This Let's could be one out. of those things where like, because I'm seeing they're advertising a lot of their like individual products. I mean, this is one out of hundreds of ads they're running. The skillet. They have the skillet landing page. See the cook. This looks like a bundle landing page. Oh, you have the cook set. Let's see what else. That might be the only one for the cook set. Maybe because a $300 product might be harder to persuade someone in paid top of funnel traffic than you know, a 65 or $52 product. So maybe that's just something they've had more success with, but it looks like they are advertising some of it. It's definitely not where they're investing a lot of their creative resources. I could see them doing a lot of cross sells and upsells of these other products or even the bundles in email or in other channels, maybe as a second or third purchase in the funnel yep. uh, to get a lot of repeat purchase rates because that is a smart thing they do too, is it's not just a knife. It's yeah. a whole cookware brand that lends itself to higher average order values, higher lifetime values, more opportunities for cross sales and repeat business. 
And that's how you scale from just making money from the top of the funnel through paid acquisition, new customers, which is the most expensive way to get customers, to getting very profitable repeat business long time. So that's a smart move by them. And it's a simple, very controllable one too. 20 products, you may have five products, but they all make sense and go together well. If you're watching this and you're looking for ways to improve your e-commerce store, there's a lot that Mizen is doing, a lot they can do. There's so much optimization to do. This never stops. You can literally spend like a whole year just working on the optimization of the checkout page like we were talking about. It's hard to do everything because you're just strapped for time and strapped for, <laughs> strapped for time, you're strapped for cash, you're strapped for like testing. If you're testing the front end of the funnel, you can't, you don't want to be testing the back end, right? Because then like, okay, the number's going to be messed up. Sometimes it's worth just like duplicating and splitting funnels and to creating a whole mm-hmm. new website where you're just testing the back end and the, another one where you're just in the front end and then you can sort of run two tests at the same time. E-commerce owners right now, they just like don't do that stuff. Anybody doing like biz ops or like internet marketing or like, you know, anybody that's teaching someone how to make money online, they're running tons and tons of funnels. The click funnels world is like, there's like a joke or stereotype that it's just people all selling the same course. I think there was a great podcast. I'm oh, sorry, Meeseng.co great brand. Um, check them out. If you're looking for knives, you know, they're a great sort of competitor, not competitor, but great product to go buy. Check us out, Digital Marketing Fast Lane. If you're looking for ads, Facebook ads, creatives, go to voidmedia.com, email Eric at Void Media or Kevin at Void Media for anything, any questions or comments, or if you like to, for us to discuss a topic on the podcast. This week's episode of Digital Marketing Fast Lane was brought to you by the performance marketing experts at Voy Media. Join us again next time as we'll be bringing you more tips, techniques, and know how to make your online business the very best that it can be. If you have any questions, comments, or feedback, we'd love to hear them on Twitter at Voy Media. Thank you.